Hello everyone, I'm Zachi. I handle public engagement at the Archive for LTV. Um, I'm very pleased to be welcome to the to the Archive's public lecture series. As some of you who have attended these lectures before or are familiar with this space already, might know. The Archives at NCBS is a public collecting center for the history of science in contemporary India. We house over 100,000 process papers, photographs, equipment, recordings, and more. If you have some time today, please do drop by. We're right around the corner of this building. Or you can visit us at uh, archives.ncbs.rus.in. As part of our program, we organize this lecture series with talks by individuals based on their vast body of work and service. These talks are framed around their experience in and around the archives and more broadly around the history of ideas. The series has included discussions by artists, archivists, academicians, lawyers, teachers, journalists, and more. For this lecture, which is the 53rd edition of the series, we are honored to have Dr. Kurushan Dalal to our campus. Dr. Dalal is an archaeologist, a culinary anthropologist, and a music consultant. He has an MA in archaeology from Deccan College and a PhD on the early Iron Age in Rajasthan from Pune University. His work centered around early medieval period, predominantly on the west coast of India, and he has excavated the sites of Sanjar, Chandaur, and Mandal. Dr. Dalal also actively works on memorial stones and ice stones in India and dabbles in numismatics, defense archaeology, architecture, um, ethno archaeology, and allied disciplines. He has blended his passion for food, food and archaeology into a research in culinary anthropology and food archaeology. He runs a very successful course called the Study Food Workshop. He also runs a small catering business called KP's Kitchen. The talk today is titled Why Do We Eat What We Eat? Uh, the Archaeology, Anthropology, History, and Politics of Food. We will have some time for QA after the talk is done, and we can take the discussion further over refreshments outside. Um, until then, thank you, Gurush, for your time and effort. How much time do I have? One hour. <laughs> uh, yeah. One hour plus questions. Including. Including. Yeah. <laughs> First, they tell you this vast body of your life's work. At least you stop referring to my rather vast body. But uh, okay. So uh, we've got to make this quick and we've got to make this fast. And if we did this with pictures, we'd never get there. So uh, as she said, I'm an archaeologist and a culinary anthropologist. And the latest thing that I do is. I'm a museum consultant, it's great fun. Uh, as somebody who's addressing you all today, uh, let me tell you that the journey has been a really fun journey. Uh, there are probably no other culinary anthropologists in the country. I am a self-proclaimed culinary anthropologist. <laughs> the fun part is, if you refute me, you've got to kind of come down into the mud with me. The reason I'm a culinary anthropologist and not an archaeologist or a historian as I've been with training through my formal training is essentially because the archaeology of food stops where the history of food should start. The history of food in India is abysmal to say the least. The archaeology of food is not a subject in archaeology. And it is studied under very science heavy verticals like archaeozoology ceramic studies, uh, paleobotany, palynology. They all have to do with food, but they don't kind of recognize the fact that there are sub-disciplines under food. They would like to see themselves as sub-disciplines under archaeology at the very most. To be some sub-disciplines would probably kill them. Um, my story started with my wife, who kept telling me that I, did, I loved archaeology and I loved food. That I studied archaeology and I was running a, a food vertical, and that I should talk about the archaeology and the history of food. And I felt like all wives, she was biased and, you know, thought too highly of her husband and that this really wasn't my calling. She then teamed up with a friend of mine who ran one of India's first uh, food studios. And when I told them I wouldn't do a lecture on the archaeology of food, they decided to do something very interesting about doing food from the past. So what would something have been cooked during the Harappan era? What would have been cooked uh, in the early medieval period? 
what would Chandragupta Maurya have eaten? I mean, what does the data tell us? You know, what is really Mughal food and not Mughalai, which is a cuisine that no Mughal would register, would not register <laughs> as being associated with? It's kind of like Sino Chinese, you know. No self respecting Chinese would eat my plate and the boys. <laughs> so uh, I thought that was fun. So we said, okay, we'll do that. And then after the tickets had all been sold and we had a full house, they said, and we've announced that you're doing a lecture on the archaeology of food for that. And my blood ran cold. I thought they were nuts. The next thing was, what the hell? There's always Google. Jiska koi ni, uska Google barwal. And um, I sat down. I thought I was very good at the Googling business. And about four or five hours later, I realized there was nothing on Google on the archaeology of food in India. This is when my blood froze, didn't just run cold. Because now it was all over. I mean, I had six days left. So I spent the rest of the day panicking very happily, you know, completely going to pieces. Uh, and then kind of said, okay, we've got to do this, right? People have paid for this. And I asked myself the next day what the archaeology of food would have been. And I realized that there was an enormous amount of work on the archaeology of food. That Paleobotany had studied ancient grains ancient fruit remains, ancient food remains for the longest time ever. They just hadn't called them food. That archaeozoology had talked about the entire domestication of species. They talked about what domestic species were versus wild species were, what ratios of meat were eaten, uh, what the preferred methods of killing animals and butchering them were, what the breakdown of a carcass was. All of this had been done. It just hadn't been called food. So this kind of slotted itself very well. I did what we call paleoanthropology after that, which looks at human beings, which looks at uh, you know the kind of uh, human remains that we find. Archaeologists love burials. That we are like grave robbers who do it with glee. You know, other grave robbers do it for a living. We do it with glee because this is where the real stuff is, you know, the juicy bits. I mean, that will be dried up, but it's the juicy ones. Because otherwise, you are finding discarded, thrown away, a random shit. Here we're finding stuff that's intact and put together. Burials give us an enormous amount of data on people, uh, their nutritional problems, uh, their lifestyle, uh, what they've been through, the pathologies that they've had, so on and so forth. And many of them are about food again. Then you have ceramics to tell you about all the vessels that we used through the ages. And now we have an entire range of specializations. Uh, we have people who look at lipid profiles from inside ceramics. We've recreated the oldest curry, as we call it in India, from a vessel from a burial from a Harappan site in Haryana, where we have a curry made up of brinjols, man raw mango, ginger, turmeric, uh, mustard oil, and salt. We've recreated it. It's a very weird thing to eat. Uh, but you have, you have to do these things, right? I did this with the Museum of Food. And believe you me, uh, if I'd known in advance what I was going to eat, I would have been a little more guarded in my kind of expression. So like, <laughs> instead of, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, whatever. So uh, the archaeology of food can only tell you that much. At some point, you have to move beyond this and start looking at art history. Uh, people in Egypt are so blessed. You know, the person overseeing the royal kitchens it's a nice burial and the sides of his tomb are covered in what he did for a living. The guy who ran the people's mess at Saqqara tells us all about how bread was made for the people building the pyramids and we realize they were not slaves. That, you know, they were really taken care of. There was a huge mess, stuff like that. And then you actually find a burnt mold with an entire burnt loaf inside it, thrown up into the garbage. And that makes us really happy because we can correlate now. So once in a while, we get the actual remains. Most of the time, we get stuff like this. We get beautiful hunting scenes at Rebecca telling us how dogs were used by ancestors to hunt, so on and so forth. And the archaeology of food can take you that far. You then come to this vertical called the history of food. I'm going to go back after kind of running through these topics. So uh, the history of food basically in India starts really early. It starts right with Ayurveda. So everybody who thinks that Ayurveda is a healing science uh, is drinking the wrong stuff, okay? Ayurveda is not a medical system. Ayurveda is a holistic way of life. 
Ayurveda believes that all those illnesses you have are an imbalanced body. And that body needs to be brought back into balance. It talks of things called the three doshas, pitta, kapha, and uh, vata, which I translated to, and I don't really stop here because I'm trying to think of the right words to use. With school children, I can use the real words, but uh, well, pitta, kapha, vata. Now, your pitta, kapha, vata have to be aligned together. There are nine different pulses, three main pulses that tell you this, and three low pulses and three high pulses and so on and so forth. No two Ayurvedic Vaidyas will agree on the illness that you have. And even if they do, they will have a completely different set of uh, things you should do to bring your systems into alignment. And surprise, surprise, both of those systems might work because they have absolutely no clue what the active ingredients are in what they're giving you to take. Uh, and we in India are too uh, sneaky to actually sit down and break down every single one of these. Uh, then you have interesting people like Mr. Patanjali and company <laughs> who uh, do some amazing things for us by mass marketing uh, Ayurveda. And uh, most traditional Ayurvedics want to kill themselves because uh, you can't mass produce Ayurvedic herbs. They have to be, you know, the right face of the moon, growing under the right tree, and the right frog has to have peed on the left hand <laughs> side. It's not like that. So, it's basically about terroir. And local terroirs change. You can't replicate this in the greenhouse. So, what those herbs will be picking up will make an enormous difference to them. And then uh, the one eyed gentleman makes an enormous amount of money and goes around telling people that he can cure AIDS. Uh, so, that's Ayurveda for you. Shushruta Charaka. Both talk actually in detail about Ayurveda. And those who would like to read Ayurveda, read to me, read these guys first. The Ayurveda of their times is hugely different from the Ayurveda that is practiced today. Today, Ayurveda is a Jain influenced Gupta era vegetarian art. Their Ayurveda is a very different art. It's great fun. They both tell you not to eat too much red meat. And then they turn around when you're recovering from illness and say, beef bone soup. Beef bone soup. Okay? Uh, because that's what has maximum curative properties. And by the way, soup is an Indian word. We actually have it in Ashoka's inscriptions. He tells us how only one deer and three peacocks or something like that were being slaughtered to make soup in his kitchens because now he was a reformed man. Wondering of the wild dead that died in his kitchens before. <laughs> so interestingly, we have some very interesting insights like this. We have a lot of textual data, uh, which we would like to say would be even earlier. Essentially, what we call the Vedic and later Vedic databases. It's very difficult to slot them chronologically. Uh, the Rigveda would be somewhere in the vicinity of 1500 BC, give or take 400 years. Uh, the later Vedic period would be most of the other Vedas and then the Upavedas so on and so forth, which would be somewhere around 1000 BC. Uh, the Vedas continuously tell us about the consumption of beef, the consumption of meat. Uh, they tell us all about sacrifices, the animals are sacrificed. Uh, and we are a very happy uh, Brahmin community who is eating beef. You come to the Upavedas and they tell you interesting things about food also without being specifically the history of food. Uh, you have people like the great um, Saint Yajnavalkya, or sage, I should say. And Yajnavalkya actually says in his text, quote, unquote, I love eating beef, especially if it is tender and cooked well. What he's insinuating is that he likes eating meal. Oh my God. So uh, you have text upon text. Even the mad Manu of the Manusmriti, the misogynist Manu, actually states. Uh, that if a Brahmana refuses prasadam, which is beef, then he will be born as pinworms in feces for the next 20,000 years. Yeah, it's pretty hard. 20,000 years of being born <laughs> as pinworms in shit. And, you know, they don't really have a long lifespan. There's many lifespans spent up to your neck in shit. Yeah, that's pretty harsh. So uh, we go from there. We come into the period of the Buddha, the Jinnah, and various other figures like that. 
And we see some rampant changes taking place. The fight against Brahmanism becomes a food fight. Uh, the Jains become completely, you know, their fifth pillar is Ahimsa. And they take it to an extent where, you know, they want to go around walking with masks, you know, the predecessors of the pandemic period, and they knew it was coming, uh, so that they don't inhale microscopic life. And they preferably go around with a broom in front of them so that they don't step and kill life. It's okay if you eat uh, farm products, which kill millions of lives every time you put a plow into the soil, but well, that's somebody else's problem, right? <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, we're slightly hypocritical about these things even when we go about them, but we try our best. So, Jainism goes to this extent. Uh, uh, Buddhism basically has no problem with the eating of meat, but asks you not to take life. The Buddha's last meal, by the way, is pork. And the Buddha knows it's going to kill him. And he knows it's going to kill him according to the scriptures, uh, very painfully. And then he tells Ananda before he dies that please do not take this out on Chunda the blacksmith who gave me this pork when I went with my begging bowl to his door. Uh, this is not his karma. This is my karma. So this is what's left of me to pay back before I can gain complete and total release. My wanting to stay back to share the message has developed a certain amount of karma and I have to make good for it. So these religions talk about Ahimsa, but are pretty okay with householders leading their lives, eating what they do eat, uh, asking you to do things in moderation. There are no real texts on food per se till we come to the medieval period. And this is a bit distressing. The first medieval texts that we start getting are texts like the Manasolasa, which is telling us so much more than just food. You have Sobishwara. Here, yeah, Mangalarasa, various authors like that who are royal authors, who are very interestingly coming from Jain kings and telling us about the eating of onions and garlic. You have the Manasolasa, which tells us all about the eating of bandicoots and elephants. Uh, so, yeah, it also, by the way, tells us that, uh, you know, the war between Bengal and Odisha over the Rasgulla. <laughs> well, the Kanadigas made it first. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of cruel. A cruel blow to the Bengalis, you know. <laughs> the GI tagged it, but they didn't do it first. So, yeah. And a lot of these subtexts tell us about how we developed a sugar industry. We have texts from outside the country which tell us about these things. You have the Arabs talking about it in great detail about sweet salt and so on and so forth coming from India. And we know that salt in India has been around for at least the last 1500 years, if not more. Definitely for the last, I would say, 1600 years or so, we've had sugar in India. It's not the white sugar that we have today. It's a brown sugar, a gura as we call it. And there will be that which is boiled, strained, and then made into batasha. But the white sugar that we eat today, or the transparent sugar, which is chini, actually comes thanks to a Chinese gentleman who's fleeing home and who settles down in Bengal called Tomachu. And this is not the Chinese of Bengal. Okay, Tom Achu lives, marries <clears throat> local women. I don't know whether he's left his DNA behind or not, and dies separately from the Hakka Chinese who come down to Calcutta. Coming back to the history of food, we have some very, very interesting texts with the coming of Islam. So, the coming of Islam and the illuminated manuscripts that we have, we have an amazing book written almost exactly in 1500 AD called the Nimat Nama. And sadly, there's only one folio that exists. It's beautifully illustrated with the foods and the people who are preparing the foods and consuming the foods. It's just one folio and it's in the British Library. I don't know whether to be happy about it or sad. Uh, yeah, no, because they preserved it. We would have probably used it uh, or abused it or whatever. You then have a number of books, especially during the Mughal era, which talk in great detail about the food that the royals ate. But what is missing in this entire history is the food of the people. And I'm not even talking about, you know, things like Dalit food. Let's not go that far down the line. We don't even have what the ordinary Joe on the street is eating during these periods. And it's quite disturbing when you're trying to study the history of food to find this. What you find out afterwards is when you leave the history of food towards its colonial era, that we owe an enormous debt 
to the British and to the entire concept of writing books. Some of the earliest cookbooks in India are written by Europeans and are about Europeans managing the kitchens in India. And, you know, we are jotting some of Madras diary and things like that. And then suddenly, right at the very end of the 19th century, you have this explosion that commences all the way into the first three decades of the 20th century, when Indians start writing books in English mainly, also in Hindi, also in Bengali, also in Gujarati, but we start writing books and publishing them about our various cuisines. Uh, create historical texts because most of them have the food of the community and also have other foods that were eaten side by side. So Lakshmi Bhai Durandar, when she's talking about the food of the Pathari Prabhus, also tells you how to make cake and pastry because you need to entertain when your husband's guests come home. Kamala Bhai will tell you something similar. You will have the Vadya mother and daughter duo uh, doing this amazing book on Pasi food called Vividwani and again, along similar lines. So uh, the influences are very, very interesting. The changes are very, very interesting. And what is fascinating to see is that there is almost nothing authentic about the recipes. If you ever want to study food, you've got to take this word authentic, put it in a little box, put that into a lead-lined box and sink it. There is no such thing as authentic in food. Every single generation changes every single recipe. Even recipes written down are rarely ever followed to the last word. In fact, most great cookbook authors will tell you, read the recipe and then figure out what you need to take from it. Because, for example, my amount of sweetness might not be what your family eats. My recipe might be very sour, and you guys might not be into it, but it might not be sour enough. You might want more of that to balance the sweetness, so on and so forth. So the history of food becomes more and more interesting as we come into the 20th century. And then we have a vast explosion of historical and quasi-historical texts. Cookbooks uh, are still cookbooks. We also have menus. You know, there's the menu from the Titanic, for example, which tells us what they all ate and why they sank because their bellies were full of lead and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, you have a lot of cookbooks that come from Europe, and it really hurts when you find cookbooks from uh, the Bronze Age uh, written in the Yale tablets, and you can't even read what the Harappans wrote for you. I know it's, it's, it's very frustrating. It's, this lack of writing in India gets my book. And we, we have terrible at history. We have no word for history. Itihasa does not mean history. Um, we have no other word, so we cling to it. Um, the history of food becomes very complicated in the end of the 20th century and into the 21st century because people are writing books, left, right, and center, which supposedly contain you know, histories and grimoires of food that have been found in shelves and attics and things like that, where most of it is just salesmanship. You also have a huge ton of books written by royal families, which are based on historical documents that they have, but this is the food of the royals. Sadly, to this very day, there are perhaps two Dalit cookbooks that exist, just two. I know. There is no serious cookbook on the tribes of India. Doesn't exist. There are perhaps three books in the whole of the Northeast, excluding Assam. So the historical quotient hasn't much improved even today. The Bengalis have forged on, the Gujaratis have forged on, the Maharashtrians have become so prolific that now there's a new book coming out, you know, probably on the hour every hour. Uh, the Kanadigas have been a little guarded and whatever data there is, is essentially in Kannada and therefore a little more difficult to evaluate, but it's there. Uh, the Tamilians, more parochial, but again, more data available. The Keralites, very, very fascinating because there are a huge number of Muslim Keralites, Christian Keralites of different flavors within the Suryanis, and of course, Hindu Keralites. Then there are the Tamilian Keralites, all Kataeers who are neither this side nor that side. And, uh, you know, believe that they're better than both sides. <laughs> It's a survival mechanism. Um, and all of them have extensive writings in the recent period. So in the recent period, there's been 
a decent bit of this available to us. How much of it is historical is difficult. When we look at the politics of food, which is, I think, the third thing in what I'm supposed to be saying, right? When you look at the politics of food, it's, it, it hammers down on you. The politics of food is something that you realize that starts from the very beginning. Uh, hunting gathering societies have a kind of politics in food that we have never seen again. We were hunter gatherers from, let's say, scavenger hunter gatherers from about a million and a half years ago, all the way to 11,000 years ago. And a few of us continued to be hunter gatherers even after that till very recently. Traditional hunter gatherer politics says that when you hunt and kill something, you distribute the best cuts. You keep the most cuts for yourself. Can you imagine why? So that you get the best cut from others? Yes, because the others, and there are enough others, will be successful collectively more often than you will be. So you will need better cuts if you distribute good cuts. It's also a matter of great pride to distribute food to those who cannot provide with their own food. So widows, the injured, so on and so forth. And this gains great merit. Everything is about giving merit. And therefore, it is old hunters who marry very, very young brides because they have enormous merit and therefore enormous cred. And young hunters marry much older women because they don't have the cred to make the marriages that they'd like to, but they're working towards it. It's also a way of safeguarding the best genetic material in the tribe because you want that genetic material which has lived long enough and accumulated that kind of knowledge and promise to continue and you don't want the genetic material of every Tom Dick and Harry when he's 17 and full of beans because who knows what quality DNA that is right so people studying DNA probably get really worked up about my comments it's okay that's the point as we move on from a hunting gathering world and a beautiful hunting gathering world where we're continuously on the move and we're continuously eating very, very interesting things. We're eating local, we're eating seasonal, we're eating so healthy that today's dietitians will start tearing out their hair because they have no work to do. Right? Because that's all there is to bloody eat. And no, the paleo diet didn't exist back then. Because what diet was eaten in the Paleolithic period had no soy bread and nonsense like that. Okay, so put that paleo diet out of your mind. There's nothing paleolithic about it. Uh, you would have to eat an enormous amount of meat, half cooked. Yeah, so so on and so forth. <laughs> now, hunter gatherers continuously on the move. Something very important that you must note that food does. This kind of a diet ensures a very, very small, tight population. So how does diet work on population? This is the way it works. Since you're continuously on the, on the move as a nomadic group of people, a woman cannot have more than one child in arms. If she has more than one child in arms at any given point, all three will die. So how many of you all have less than three years between you and your elder sibling? Put your hands up. You're all dead. <laughs> So along with infant mortality, along with the kind of hardships that life had at that time, it kept our population growing at an absolutely minuscule rate. We believe that 18,000 years ago, there were between, depending on which paleo demographics you believe, 2 million and 12 million individuals on this entire planet. Just to put this, in context, there are 22 million individuals in Bombay city. <laughs> so that's how many there were on the entire planet. Now, 2 million is one extreme, 12 million is the other extreme. Take a middle point of about 8 million or so and think of how widely we were scattered. It was dry, it was cold, it was the ice ages, and human beings by about 45,000 to 30,000 years ago had become the ultimate killing machines on this planet. We were so good at hunting and gathering that we worked approximately four hours a day. Yes, all of us were putting in 10 hours at work. I feel you. Right? To add to this, 
we now had a lot of time and full bellies. So we had music, art, religion, the dirty art word, <laughs> right? All of this was possible now because we had the time. Cows don't have religion for a simple reason. They don't have time. They're either ingesting or digesting, right? That's what a cow's life is all about. That's, therefore, there will never be a Paramahansa Yogananda amongst cows. So, life is beautiful. And then the ice ages come to an end. And the politics of food is going to change permanently with this event. So first of all, what happens is all the ice melts. Uh, in some places, there's up to two kilometers of ice. So you can understand what that happens, right? All those people are worried about climate change uh, and sea level change. This is about 125 meters that the sea rises off. So every time somebody talks about five centimeters in the last 100 years, I feel like laughing because that's not sea level change. That's just fluctuation on a local basis. Uh, 125 meters, that's sea level change. All those shallow areas around the continents get inundated, the nice warm seas instead of these icy cold seas. All those little animals that had to breed in their millions so that a few individuals survived now have these plentiful breeding grounds to like, you know, make merry while the sun shines and all kinds of rain is bringing up all kinds of nutrients into these beaches. Human beings are living on these beaches and virtually picking up their food from the sea directly without any effort. You build a simple fish trap. It's a U-shaped or V-shaped wall going into the sea like this. You chink it as well as you can with stones. You know water will go through it. At high tide, everything comes over. As the low tide starts going out, fish don't know there's a wall in the way. And the water goes away and the fish flopping down there. You walk out, pick up your lunch and go back home. Life is super on the coasts. The forests get forestier. I mean, there's not a word that I have for it. The grass gets grassier. All those ice covered areas become grasslands. Ungulates start breeding like it's going out of fashion because there's so much grass. Okay. Um, all those forests are full of stuff to eat. Everybody's very happy. And the fun part is you don't have to move too much. So you can start kind of spending more time in one place than you did before. Six months here, three months there. Movement is a one-time movement from one location to the other seasonally. Uh, food is plentiful. And of course, there are these long nights. There's no Netflix. Um, there's no internet. There's no Instagram reels. All you got to do in the dark hours is uh, practice procreation. And we become damn good at it. You know, practice makes perfect, guys. We will talk that about our lives. So we practice procreation, become damn good at it. And we are doubling our population every couple of hundred years. There's only one tiny hitch. You all, have, all of you all seen Channel V in the old days. There was this character called Bai who would say, Itna paisa mein itna hitch milega. So there was only that much grass for that many deer. It was a one time increase. We didn't quite realize that. That the increase in food was a one time increase. You know, everybody goes on and on about Darwin and the evolution of the species. Probably the most important thing he discussed was the carrying capacity of the land. We exceeded the carrying capacity of the land. Now, till this point, there was just two things that we have in common with our ancestors, the way they ate and the way we eat today. Sugar and salt. Every human being needs three grams of salt a day. You have to have three grams of salt a day. If cumulatively you stop having three grams of salt a day, uh, you will have ischemic problems. But worse than that, uh, your cellular structure will start falling apart. Every single one of your cells needs, for its integrity, a certain amount of salt. You're all biologists here. You know what I'm talking about. I don't have to preach to the masses over here. Uh, the other thing is sugar. Sugar is what all mammals are hardwired towards. We've been hardwired towards consuming sugar because it's not easily available in nature. So these two drives to consume salt and sugar, to sit down and eat some namkeen and then have a jalebi after that, 
okay actually is hardwired into your code this is why you crave it because both of these are not very easy to get hunter gatherers get all the salt that they need from the meat that they eat and that's unintentionally poetic okay uh, farmers on the other hand need to add salt to their food salt is the one mineral you cannot live without all salt unless it's actually made in a laboratory with sodium and chlorine is non vegetarian there is no such thing as vegetarian salt all salt can contains large amounts of foraminifera in it it contains dead bits from the sea and they are all non veg and before you say i don't eat rock salt that is concentrated non veg that is the bottom of the stream that's like billions of dead fish and they poop okay that's what the minerals basically are so yes remember this millions of dead fish and sea creatures are their poop is what gives salt that color so dark black salt and red salt and gray salt and blue salt that's the shit you're eating so all salt is not much there but let's come back to this period called the mesolithic where you enjoyed such happy food times and all these times are coming to an end suddenly there are too many of us and not enough food and the politics of food changes forever war comes to mankind stronger groups start pushing weaker groups out of their foraging lands and taking over those foraging lands many of them start adjusting to the amount of food available to try and be sustainable what is already there and others are forced into semi arid regions and they have only one choice they have to grow their own food or die over a period of about 3 or 4000 years millions of our ancestors died they keep getting pushed out and they die because they're learning how to farm and it's not that easy it takes about 3 to 4000 years to really lick the problem of growing your own food from a protein heavy diet we switch to an almost pure carbohydrate diet because this is the only thing you can grow once a year and store and eat throughout the year so from a diet that consisted of seasonal food we now move to a diet that is made up of starch starch and more starch everything that we eat today is a story of the last 8 to 11000 years depending on where you are maharashtra and south is mainly all millets in fact the four great states of south india are almost exclusively ragi with other millets thrown in like proso so on and so forth there is no rice idli in tamil nadu or karnataka or anywhere else in the south by the way the original idli is pure udan dal then you start throwing a little rice because it's cheaper and little more rice because it's cheaper and little more rice because it's cheaper and now it's one is to five right <laughs> try making a pure udan dal idli it won't put you to sleep and it will give you far more protein than anything else but don't be fooled dals are not protein dals are complex carbohydrates eating a lot of dal or sprouted dal does not mean you're putting down enormous amounts of protein and no carbohydrate you are putting a healthy dose of carbohydrate into your system if you really want a carbohydrate free diet you need to start eating boiled meat shocking isn't it the best fat your body can absorb is animal fat as in milk fat or animal fat oil is absorbed badly by your body oops <laughs> so yeah that's kind of the thought of having uh, all those bodams fried in pure ghee makes me happy but uh, uh, and yeah we kind of finding out that ghee doesn't really clog your arteries the vitamin and reasonable amounts oops <laughs> another damn thing i tell you so uh, we start growing our own grain and we start growing our own meat and we live with our meat in the same large houses that we built 
we build permanently because we need to be right next to the animals and the plants that we're growing for ourselves. And everything that we understand changes radically. To put it very quickly before Ravi starts telling me that I've run out of time, uh, we basically, okay, uh, look at food now as wealth. We start measuring everything in terms of food. Uh, we start drinking milk as an antibiotic, not as a food. We are living with our cattle, which we are eating. Okay? And diseases from cattle are coming across to us, very much like the pandemic that we just had. And we're realizing that these diseases don't hit the babies hard enough. So it's something in the milk that the children are getting, we give that to our children. And then because we have this sweet tooth built into us, and milk has a lot of lactose, it's like yummy. We are meant to be lactose intolerant. When your mother weans you, there's a switch in your stomach that's supposed to go off and stop producing lactase. Over the years, we have chosen those with the genetic ability to keep that switch on. So millions of our ancestors have died pooping, burping, and farting to death. <laughs> yeah, that's what it does to you when you're lactose intolerant. Okay, this is what, and the reason why the Chinese don't have Chinese roshagullas and Chinese kheer is because the animals that they domesticated were not conducive to producing milk. Chickens and pigs. Chickens don't have the equipment. Uh, pigs, on the other hand, you have to be a maniac to try and milk a pig. Okay. A pharaoh in sow will take your fingers off. Okay? So I have made the mistake of asking a Chinese colleague of mine at a conference about this. So he video called his father. And after he asked his question, his father had a kind of a four minute harangue. Okay, a very violent moving arm. Something is put it down. He says, My father says, No. <laughs> Why? And he says, uh, You see, he says that after she's got 12 babies permanently putting at her uh, milky bits, uh, and she's so sore that she hates it. If you try to reach out for them with your clammy little fingers, she take them off. And don't I have enough brains that I'm a farmer's son? And how, how dare I ask him such a stupid question? So, uh, farming also does things to our minds and our religion that nothing else does. Uh, you know what farming is, right? You spend a lot of hours sitting and watching this amazing stuff. It's this mind stimulating thing. You watch grass grow. <laughs> I mean, it's grass, it's growing. Wow! And you got to keep doing it so that it grows and gives you grain, otherwise, it will stop. What do you do as a kid? You take the cows out to eat. And then you sit on a little rock in the midday sun and you watch them eat and digest. Almost as stimulating. Uh, and with that sun permanently baking your brains, right? And you notice that uh, Mama, Jesus, Krishna, they're all in the taking care of animals in the sun business. <laughs> Addling their brains. <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. Okay? Uh, you know, Abraham on the mountain types. Uh, we can understand why he was having these, you know, delusions of God speaking to him. <laughs> Lost in that hot desert. Yeah. Poor man with his tablets coming down and saying, these are the 15, oops, 10 commandments of the Lord. <laughs> you got to read, you got to see Mel Brooks, he'll explain it to you better. And so on and so forth. So the sun does crazy things to us. And it does some crazy things to us religiously. All that tapasya, you know, standing on one leg on a rock in the sun. We Indians are great at it. It really blows our mind. Those hallucinations are on a different level. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, we are good at this stuff. Come on, guys. We've got, we've got Bollywood. Mithun can hide behind a cycle when people are shooting at you. <laughs> so, yeah, our imagination is what it is because of what it is. So, to come back to it, we start hoarding our food. All of us are growing food. And then we start something called craft specialization. And we barter goods for food because that is the only currency we have. And in doing so, we start creating a society which is essentially a chieftain society. 
a chieftain society where the chief is not selected or elected, but is hereditary. Who, when he says jump, the only question you ask him is how high? Yeah. You know, in a very happy hunting gathering society, if you don't like what the chief says, you can give him the finger and walk out. Uh, in this society, he'll have you drag back, break one of your legs, and ensure that you work twice as hard because he has enforcers. This actually creates an entire caste, a ruling elite and their enforcers. What in India would be the Shatiyas? It creates an entire caste of farmers and traders, which would be the Vaishyas. And it leaves room for all of those people outside the system to become shudras. And then smart guys in the system who really don't want to work at anything, uh, tell you that they're going to teach you and take care of your gods and they become brahmins. I think that they're the real smart cookies, I mean, of the past. So the long and short of it is it changes the way we think. Chiefdom society looks at hoarding of goods, it looks at hoarding of food, it looks at accumulation of food, and it looks at bringing war to other societies to take their food. And in doing so, create centers of specialized production where everybody has to come there for all the specialized goods that they need, be it baskets, be it pottery, be it metalworking, be it beads, whatever, adornment, etc., etc. So that a small tax it's a protection racket, basically, government can be levied on you. So it's like this, you don't pay and your shop gets burnt that night and the grand high chief comes in. So bad, Ravi. But if you'd only, you know, all those miscreants, very bad what they did. If you'd only been, you know, under my protection, it's not happening. Ravi gets the hit. Ravi pays up. Right? So this is how we, politics completely changes because of food and food changes our politics. Uh, eat as I say, not as I do. That is the new politics. And food then becomes something that is used by political movements to tell you how to live your life and to control you. When people who do not eat a certain food tell you not to eat a certain food. When they look down upon you because of the food you eat, and consider themselves superior because of the food they eat. Where they bring in all kinds of ethical arguments, which are pure conjecture. Okay? And they tell you that, you know, spiritually you are on a lower level. Eat meat. Oh, you eat beef, you are on the lowest level possible. Without looking at their own history. Without looking at their own past, which they don't want to look at. And they don't want you to look at either, because then that would empower you. Remember, this kind of empowerment is not what government wants. So uh, you have people who perform yagnas before they send out satellites into space. And uh, you wonder, just wonder, and you like, ah, whatever works for you. What the hell? I mean, if it works for you. Uh, but why are we doing this on government money? And we do Satya Narayan pujas. Uh, you know, Satyanarayana is actually uh, Avalokiteshvara from the Buddhist pantheon. So you're actually doing Buddhist rituals. But what the hell? Because you don't want to go back far enough. And because religion is all about faith. Fact would deny that faith. It would destroy the concept of religion. And therefore, you don't really want to know fact. So food changes all of this. The food of your conquerors, the food of your rulers becomes your food. There are hilarious bits of food history when you come down to the Mughals and the Marathas and the various sultanates in the Marathas. We have notations of, you know, that fellow came over and we ground down some pork and we fed it to him. <laughs> and on the other side, you got, oh, he thought he was the big cheese, right? This Maratha Bhagavi. We fed him beef, kima, and told him the mutton. So yeah, people have been doing these things forever to each other. And there's even historical data for it, which is the fun part of it. So the politics of food is crazy. The greatest example of the politics of food takes place in the Second World War in 1941-42, when realizing that it is not if, but when the Japanese take Kolkata. Not if, when the Japanese take Kolkata, uh, Mr. Winston Churchill and his team of experts sitting in England create a policy 
called. This is the name of the policy. Huh? This is government policy. This is the title. The denial of rice and boats policy. Where after a bumper crop, rice is taken away from the farmers and hoarded by the government to be given out to them so it's not accessible to the Japanese when they come pouring in. And they destroy the boats of a people who live on rice and fish. First they take away their rice and they destroy their ability to fish. Four million people died. And you know what the tragedy is? They didn't need to. You could justify this and say, you know, you had to stop the Japanese. But they stopped the Japanese at Infar. Because there was just one man, General Slim, who had a plan to stop the Japanese. And he stopped the Japanese thanks to Mountbatten believing in him. And making him, so Mountbatten was supreme commander in the East after the debacle that was Singapore. And he came here, found all his generals were talking about when the Japanese would come to Calcutta. And then he went to Barakpur and he found this one guy called Slim who was talking about how to take the war back to the Japanese. So he disregarded all his other generals, made Slim commander and said, Slim, we've got to stop the Japanese. And they stopped the Japanese. And all those people in Bengal died. Four million officially, you know, guys, officially four million. So you can, you know how governments work. Six million Jews died in the Second World War. Four million Bengalis died in the Second World War. We don't talk about it. Uh, because we were second class citizens of the empire. That's why. And because it was the poor who died, not the elite who lived in Calcutta, who had all the rice that they could get their hands on, but the poor. So uh, the politics of food is one of the most dastardly things that you can do. To create a beef ban, 9,000 people in Mumbai lost their jobs overnight with the stroke of one old Bengali gentleman who was feeling his mortality as he resigned or finished his tenure as president of India. And guess what? The next day, posters all over Bombay said that the cow had been saved, that mother cow had been saved. The tragedy was that there was always a ban on the slaughter of cows and calves. You could only slaughter bulls and bullocks if you had a certificate saying they were no longer viable for farm use, which meant old animals. This was the protein of the poorest of the poor. Everybody else was already eating buff. And you know, buffaloes are black, so they're low caste. You can slaughter them whenever you want. It's cool. That's, that's the way we function. So uh, buffalo meat was the beef of the upper castes. They were very happy with it, everybody. We still are. But with the stroke of a pen, 9,000 people lost their jobs. And we felt righteous because we'd saved the cow. So the study of food will not set you free. The more you study food, the more you realize how deeply entrenched our lives are, how what we put on our plates is because of our geography, because of our religion, and because of our history and archaeology. That's why it's essentially a culinary anthropology. Now, we've all laughed, and I've decided to close on a really scary note. About 35 years ago, the government of India realized something terrible. And by the way, you have the evidence for the beginning of that in these archives that Venkat runs. You see, India was starving to death in the 60s. We had that PL420 rice that we brought in, and it was actually condemned rice, which was, I'm sorry, meat, which was for animal feed in the US and so on and so forth and all that. And we can go through that till the cows come home. The long and short of it was one man, whose name most of us don't know, called Norman Borlock, saved us. We were up shit creek without a paddle. This crazy communist man saved us. He never patented any of his practices. He believed in giving them away free. I honestly think every ministry in India and every college in India should have a photograph of the man. Okay? And everybody should be told his story. Sadly, we don't. Because, you know, he didn't make us pay for it. We don't respect people who give away things for free in this country. So, Swami Nathan, whose papers are here, they've got about 50,000 bits 
in these archives over here, uh, was one of the leading lights of the Green Revolution. It's very easy to diss the Green Revolution today. The Green Revolution was bad. The Green Revolution was not bad. The Green Revolution is why all of us are in this room. All of us Indians at least. We would not have made it. Okay, our parents would not have made it had it not been for that Green Revolution. So we concentrated on rice and meat because these were the number one and number two staples in the country. And to help this, and to help farmers grow this, we came up with something called the minimum support price. And then we rested on our laurels and were sure that we'd solved all our problems. People stopped growing minutes because there was no MSP for it. People started on a war footing, growing rice like that never grown before. In less than 20 years, we had doubled our output of wheat and tripled our output of rice, and we've been zooming on ever since. Every year when we get those beautiful visuals of Delhi, you know, going under because of smog, it's because of this. Because people who had never grown rice before are growing rice in Haryana and Punjab. Because there is a minimum support price, they can grow rice in the wet season, wheat in the cold season, get two crops in which there is a minimum support price for. Ah. We stopped growing millets, which were more than 40% of the food grain that we grew. Today, millets make up less than uh, mm, what is half of one third, about one sixth, less than one sixth, and that includes the barley and the wheat that we grow, uh, barley and the maize that we grow in India. It's in today's newspapers for those of you who want to check out. Uh, what is so important about those millets is that millets grow when wheat and rice doesn't. Millets were always a backup crop. Most farmers who grew wheat and rice would grow millets if two crop, if two sowings failed. Even after having the greatest harvest we've ever had this year, according to the government, I'm a little skeptical, but I accept those figures. Uh, our wheat and rice, rice is at a level never seen before. Our ragi and our jowar has gone down further. And this is the International Year of the Millet, which was proposed by India. And we are growing less of it than ever before. It's not the year of the millet because the government suddenly wants your nutrition to be taken care of. It's because in the last 35 years, governments have known that the growth of the production of food, the growth, growth in rate of food production is less than the growth in rate of food consumption. Nobody is addressing the white elephant in the room. There are too many of us to feed. So our food production is slowing down and our food production consumption is going up. 2035 is when the fund starts. We should reach parity if we continue at today's levels. 2050 is when food riots take place. The only thing that can save us is millets. But the farmers that farm millet have stopped farming it. So when you study food, which is one of the three things you have to do to stay alive, breathing is involuntary. Sleeping is also involuntary. You can be kept awake. You cannot stay awake after a certain point. But eating and drinking are completely voluntary. We do not study food. The government, I think, doesn't really want to study food because it's in a horrible bind. And uh, if we don't start studying our food and we don't start doing something about it now, there will be no pieces left to pick up. On that happy note, thank you very, very much to archives that has inspired me and all of you all for packing up this hall and sitting in the aisles and listening to me. Uh, very, very warming to see such an audience. You all are the future of our country and our world. And most of you all are young over here. And you all will have to live through those years. So you all need to start. <laughs> 2050, I'll be here. I'm not going to make it. Not past eight. OK? Uh, no, jokes aside, guys. We were laughing about it because there's nothing else you can do. But if you all don't take your future into your hands, uh, it's going to be hard. Maybe there's some magic bullet 
that the government will pull out. Maybe the gods will be kind and rain food through the skies. But since I'm kind of skeptical about that, I really don't think that's happening. Maybe enough yagnas will do it for us. <laughs> Thank you. Now open up the floor for any comments or questions. So whoever wants to ask can raise the hand and we will hand over my feet. Everybody's too depressed to ask anything. <laughs> Remember that was gorgeous coffee. Uh, so, introduction of different vegetables by the Europeans, like Kutai and all. How do you think that actually changed the landscape of Indian food? Habit? Hugely. Think of Indian food without a potato. No aloo and aloo parathas. No aloo and samosas. No aloo to eat with your puris in the morning. What are you going to do? No aloo in your pulao, in your biryani. I mean, vegetarians wouldn't know what to do without potatoes. And then there is paneer, which to a large extent, they kind of proliferated. And then there's tomatoes. Imagine Indian food with the chilies, tomatoes, and potatoes. What would you cook? Right? So the Colombian exchange did bring in some amazing stuff, which we took to because it grew well, grew fast, and had greater yields. Our number one spice in India was pepper. And pepper grew only in specific regions, specific climatic conditions. Chilies grow anywhere, they hybridize very fast. We now have more varieties of chilies than the Americans do. And I don't mean the North Americans, I mean the Central Americans and South Americans. Uh, by the way, the, the Chinese have a huge variety of chilies too. So do the Southeast Asians. We still beat them out. The world's, uh, well, spiciest chilies came from India, the Bujjulaka, one million scoville units. Right, and now they have the California Reaper at 2.6. I have no idea why anybody wants to eat that. And then I found out it's because uh, it's because of weight and it's because of money. So if you make a spice mix that's been transported from a central warehouse all over the country, and you replace your regular chilies with Bujolakia or California Reaper, then the bulk volume goes down. Therefore, the money you pay for transporting it goes down, and therefore you make more money if you are a nice, heartless corporation. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, it made a lot of difference, but the difference is the difference of the last 250 years. Did it make a nutritional difference to us? Not really. Did it change uh, the way we add things to our food? Most definitely. Do you know the number one uh, fruit that India grows? Come on, what is India's top fruit? Bullshit. Bullshit. No, not apples. India grows 45% of the world's papaya. Yeah, papaya. And it's not really something that can be exported. We eat most of it. And papayas came to us through the Colombian exchange. So, you know, it's, it's a crazy world out there. Uh, sometimes, as somebody who's studying food, it's difficult to figure out what kind of indigenous foods do we still eat. You know, you go to the hills and they'll tell you about their authentic cuisine. And what do you get when you go to Himachal and uh, Jammu and all those places? What do they basically eat? Rajma chawal. Rajma is about 200 years old. About 160, 70 years old in India. And it was brought by the French from Mexico after two ill-fated campaigns at propping up a French emperor in Mexico. You know, harsh, right? Why are Pondicherry to the hills? The name is the dead giveaway, Raj Ma. Okay. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of stuff like this. Uh, how much of our authentic food is authentic? Is what I keep telling people, you know? So we've taken to foods that work for us. We've taken to foods that give us better yields. So as farmers, you're looking at pound for pound getting more per acre. I mean, that's the winner. Everything else can go to hell. And if it tastes good, <coughs> you can't go wrong with it. So rice is easily digestible. That's why we all aspire to it. It was the upper caste food. The lower caste all aspired to it. Rice really came down to South India 
about two and a half thousand years ago. That's it. So if you read the Sangamera documents that the Tamilians keep telling you about their traditions, uh, you will see that there is not much rice in them. And that's 300 BC to 300 AD. So uh, yes, we had different diets. If you really want to see the food of Tamil Nadu, you've got to go to a good Iyer household and eat their Shrad food. And the food of their Shrad is the food of their ancestors. And it has none of the ingredients that have come to India recently. You go to the walls of the temple uh, at Puri, at Jagannath, and every single vegetable that can be cooked for the Chapan Bhog is carved onto the walls of the Jagannath temple. If it ain't there, you can't use it. And no, they don't make 56 things at one time. Chapan Bhog is a concept. Chapan Bhog is not 56 items. Even the good Lord Jagannath can't eat that. <laughs> okay? So yeah, it's made a huge impact. I mean, it saved us in so many ways. You know, potatoes are the four, fifth largest eaten uh, starch in the world. They also were responsible for the colonization of North America by the Irish because of the potato famines. So, you know, you depend on potatoes, potatoes, no potatoes, and then one insect, one blight comes along and wipes out the potatoes and you're boiling grass and eating it. You know, no, 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 it's horrible. They died in their thousands and they sent their children with whatever money they had overseas. That's why the Irish came to the new world. Yeah. Food. Yes, please. In your talk, you mentioned that you created a Harappan recipe with some raw mango and texture. See, is it into the jelly dusting? No, this dusting is just downright weird to our palate today. But I mean, uh, can you describe like the process of actually figuring this out? So they do something that is called no, they do something called lipid analysis. So what happens because most of the food is cooked in porous earthenware vessels. Every time you heat it up and you cook something in it, the lipids from that food stay back as lipid skeletons, I think is the correct word that they use, in those pores. So uh, instead of washing up ceramics like we would, you send the entire pot with its mud inside it to the lab and Steve Weber and Arunima Kashyap sat down and carefully cracked that pot open, removed all the soil, cleaned off physically the soil that they could, and then extracted those lipids from it. And those lipids are very specific to the shape. The shape of the lipids, the profile of the lipids is very, very specific to the uh, plants from which they come. So there's something very similar called protein residue analysis, which started in North America, which they do on arrowheads. Uh, so we can tell the last animal that was killed by it because there are certain long chain proteins that survive in the very, very fine grain of the chert and the chalcedony that is used to make these arrowheads. So you, one out of three, uh, you strike lucky with. It costs a thousand dollars a sample. You know, at three thousand dollars to get one option right, that would be my entire excavation budget in India. So uh, it's not happening for me. But there is a, a hundred and twenty-eight thousand year old stone knife from Tel Abrak in uh, uh, what is now Israel. And we know that our ancestors at that time were actually butchering rhinoceros. We don't know if they killed those rhinoceros, but they were butchering rhinoceros because we have rhinoceros protein in those knives. So yeah, there's some amazing stuff by which we can recreate these things. And technology is taking it to the next level today. Uh, we've actually managed to using a diamond drill bit and some very complex solvents, we actually managed to get yeast out of an Etruscan wine jar and use that yeast to make beer. But then there are crazy people on this planet. And if you send, a, you have to not have a bath for about 15 days. And then if you send a swab from your crevices, <laughs> they will make cheese using your own yeast. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, so that we, 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 can, we can do some really stupid things sometimes. But um, how many people over here come from families that make curd every day at home? 
Why does the curd in one house never taste like the curd from another house? It's all lactobacillus, right? I know it's not because the, the fridge smells different or less foul or more foul. It's because it's not just lactobacillus. Over the years, it's various other bacteria that colonize your culture, various yeasts that colonize these cultures, and little bits of dried skin from your hands that colonize these cultures. And they all bring different things to it which change the flavor profile of your curd and make it unique. So the bulk of the work is still being done by the same lactobacteria. But there's a lot of other players adding flavor to it. So we can actually track these things down. And if they're good biologists amongst those who take that curd, we could probably take those samples and find out everything that's in it. <laughs> I hope that answers your question, sir. Yes, the gentleman in the back over there. How old are beverages in comparison to the food? Or is it equally? So we started making beer before we made bread. Every loaf of bread is a whole host of grains that failed their destiny of turning into beer. Yeah. Um, you would want to drink some of that beer. It's very low alcohol beer. It's 2%, 3% beer. It's, we're basically using yeast to semi-digest the food for us. So this kind of food is actually very common and it's eaten in various, so ragi malt basically. What is ragi malt? So there is a minor amount of alcohol in it that is part of the malting process. Okay. Similarly, in Maharashtra, there's something called an ambil, where you take the grains, you boil them and you leave them overnight to soak. And the next day, you drink them as a porridge. Uh, about half of Western Africa actually drinks these beers, as they're called, murky beers, as they're called for breakfast every day. You go to Nigeria, this is what they have for breakfast, sorghum beers. But it's a 2-3% alcohol beer. So a lot of the beverages that we consume, these are far safer than drinking water. Do you know that uh, good Parsi cold drink makers in Bombay were making aerated waters way before Coke or Pepsi were a dream in their founders' eyes? Because carbonated drinks were safe. Carbonation killed everything in the water. So drinking soda was far safer than drinking water. Nobody in the medieval period in England drank water. They drank beer, but it was a very low alcohol beer. And the reason for this was that the process killed off everything else that was harmful to you. Because drinking beer in a city in medieval Europe was mainlining cholera, typhoid, jaundice, and whatever else, right? So water was only drunk in the form of beer or wine or so on and so forth. Uh, a typical breakfast in Paris would see tankards of beer on the table. And this was common all over Europe. Uh, in China, the entire purpose of drinking weak teas was that you had to boil water and then steep your tea inside it. So the cold tea that you drank through the day was far safer than drinking water. And they told you the tea was a great tonic and pick me up and whatever. Yeah, it does have uh, some stuff that makes you feel good. But uh, comparatively, it was because it forced you to boil water. So a lot of the reasons why we do things are not what we think they are. The reason why Indians drink tea is because after growing a lot of it for consumption, they grew too much and they couldn't sell it to the Europeans. So they said, let's have tea breaks in all official government factories and buildings. And the Indians rejected tea as being foul. So the tea board has notings. And the tea board notings, which you can check, don't believe me, actually say, add milk and sugar to it, the Indians will drink anything. And we did. Coffee in southern India was an upper caste thing. So the lower caste took to tea with the mentions because they were not allowed inside the coffee houses. And that's, these are these divides that you can see. You know? And uh, yeah, we do a lot of things not because we want to, but because we've been conned into. Next time we'll get filter coffee. Yes, please. In the corner. Oh, no. Uh, no, 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 no,
One minute, give her a mic. When it comes to communities with food prohibition, you know, like something like people calling from a really long time that we call it the cattle point. Um, when it comes to policies and all, like something like the food work community is there and we countries don't really eat some certain fish, for example. But I do see there's a lot of nutritional, you know, yeah. like contribution that people start eating. So what is your take on that? Because Shall we like continue? I don't know, romanticizing, but can we just continue them doing what they're doing? Okay. Uh -huh. See, this is an entire four hour session by itself. But to put it in four or five minutes before she beats me up, she's <laughs> tough, huh? Okay. Um, why do people not eat certain things? So a lot of things often have logic behind them. So there's an incredibly logical reason why kosher and halal exist. So halal is not only about meat. Halal and haram is about everything in a Muslim's life. What is haram and what is halal? What is acceptable and what is not? So uh, the concept very much like kosher of cutting the jugular and bleeding the animal to death is essentially because in those hot, arid environments, if you were to block off the head of an animal when you killed it, the blood stays behind in the circulatory system because the heart stops pumping. Since you cannot sell that meat in a couple of hours and you will be hanging it up and probably putting a wet cloth around it for people who come in the evening to buy it, you know, keeping it as fresh as possible, the things that will go bad in the meat first are the blood. You will gut the animal, you'll take the organs out, fine. But it's the blood that will poison the meat as it starts breaking down. So you want to bleed the animal, which means you have to keep the animal's heart pumping. So you cut the jugular and the animal basically bleeds itself to death. Now, if you tell people this is the sensible way to do things, they're not going to listen to you. But when you say, God said, <laughs> finish. God said is the final thing. God said we do it, <laughs> right? So kosher comes from there, halal comes from there. And a lot of these things then, when you no longer need to do them, become enshrined amongst the people. <clears throat> that this is part of my religion. And that which was done to help you now starts to hinder you. Similarly with various fish. So most, uh, and this again, so basically you've got to understand that Islam, Christianity, and Judaism are not three separate religions. There are three separate expressions under the Abrahamic faith. I know that's Absolutely right. Stab yourself with a blunt spoon kind of thing to people in Europe. But it's the truth. And there is enormous similarity between all of these faiths and the way they do things. So, uh, you know, not eating pork is a Jewish thing and should be a Christian thing. Well, Christians have kind of got around it in a very interesting way. Uh, the Muslims went back to it and said, why not, you know? Because you can't find the jugular of a pig. Unlike all other animals, which have the jugular running right outside here, pigs have a big fat neck. Okay, so finding the pig jugular would be like tying the pig down and doing a dissection of the pig to find the jugular. Okay, therefore, no pig. No eating pig because we know finding jugular. It's like that. And uh, you don't want the easy answer, no? Because the simple answer is so black. That's a nice complicated answer for it. So the good Lord said, thou shalt not eat it. And then Leviticus uh, will put it down and will tell you along with burning beef in your backyard as an offering to the gods and stoning gays and people who commit adultery and things like that. And it's all together. So you choose and pick which of these taboos you want to continue using. And the others are kind of okay. So we're, we're, we're very hypocritical people, human beings. We, we're very selective in our choices. So food taboos all work this way. Uh, in Bengal, for example, following very, very strict upper caste Hindu norm, it was taboo for widows to eat meat. It was taboo for widows to eat onions. It was taboo for widows to eat garlic and so on and so forth. You know why? Because they would get urges. <laughs> you didn't want widows getting urges. I mean, can you imagine all those licentious widows running around with urges? <laughs> so it was decided that these widows would be eat only subtle food so that they kept their urges in control. Sad. We ruined their diets, we ruined their lives, 
And uh, we did this all because of these so-called quasi-religious religious taboos. So that's the way it is. Does it answer? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you everyone for being here and uh, thank you Kurush for taking us together.